Happy Cinco de Mayo, folks, and AEW Blood and Guts Day. This is episode 388 of Hashtag Ask GSM for Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week. If you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag Ask GSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. We have a lot to get to here today, a lot of great questions. Um, it's been a very eventful week already. With the news coming out, like at midnight tonight from Fightful, uh, credit to Sean Ross set for breaking the news, that Daniel Bryan is officially a free agent as of, I think, midnight that the uh, Roman Reigns match happened on SmackDown that night following his loss. He became a free agent. So we're going to get into that here on today's episode. We had one question about that, which is going to be cool. Um, like I said, AEW and Blood and Guts Day. I'm very excited for that. Tonight should be a great show. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to answering your questions for today. A few cheap plugs. We had a couple of interviews go up already this week, so be sure to check them out. On Monday, we had my interview with Raw superstar Braun Strowman before he gets involved in the uh, WWE Championship match at WrestleMania Backlash next weekend. That went up in audio form right here on the channel and went up in article form on Bleacher Report on Monday, so check that out. And then yesterday, my interview with NXT superstar Isaiah Swerve Scott, who was coming off an awesome fucking match with Leon Ruff on NXT last night. Um, so that went up in audio form yesterday. The article should be up, or will be up, I believe, on DailyDDT.com uh, later on today on Wednesday. So check that out as well. And I do have another interview already confirmed for later on, I think maybe early next week. So that will be up in audio form, I think at the end of next week, right before WrestleMania Backlash. So lots to look forward to. But let's get right into your questions here for today, starting with Brandon A. from YouTube. Their first question was, uh, with Double or Nothing coming up in a few weeks, can you predict five matches that will end up being on that card? On a side note, I do think it's pretty ironic that they have no matches announced, even though they have two months uh, they've had two months since the last pay-per-view. WWE does that sometimes in the opposite way with a super quick turnaround to the next pay-per-view. Weird. LOL. Yeah, I don't know why they do that. I feel like they did that with Revolution, too. We didn't know about Omega and Moxley in, like, the death match until, like, weeks before the pay-per-view. You knew that's where they were going was a one-on-one -on -one rematch between the two. But honestly, as of right now, as of right now before Blood and Guts later on tonight, as of this recording, I have no idea who Omega's opponent is going to be at Double or Nothing. He just won the Impact World Championship. He's still AAA Mega Champion. Andrade challenged him at the uh, AAA show over the weekend for Triple Mania, which is cool. That's not going down to Double or Nothing, I don't think. I mean, maybe. Maybe that's the match. I feel like I honestly would be disappointed if Omega's opponent did not end up being a surprise. Because I know Eddie Kingston and Moxley have been involved in the world title mix recently. Moxley has been feuding with Omega for like the last five months. They have to move the fuck on. You know, they had the blow-off match, what you thought was the blow-off match, and it really wasn't, with Moxley and Omega at the Revolution pay-per-view. And it was a good match. The post-match shit was not good. Uh, with the whole barbed wire exploding shit. You know, fuck that nonsense. Don't even do it if it's not going to be the blow-off to the feud. And WWE does that all the time. Like, I don't know if they're still doing O'Reilly and Cole. But to do the unsanctioned match first, the unsanctioned match first, and then to do a regular match, to me, has never made any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It never will make any sense to me. So, at any rate, I don't know who you have Omega face at the pay-per-view. Um, I, I think Moxley and Kingston, one of my match predictions for the show, is that they face the Young Bucks for the World Tag Team titles. Now, I know tonight we're getting a Fatal 4-Way number one contenders match um, that I have to assume will be won by SCU. The next match they lose, they said they'll, be, they'll, they'll break up. They'll go their separate ways, which you know is coming sooner rather than later. They've been doing this story now for like five or six months, most of it playing out on Dark. They're very rarely ever on Dynamite. I'm glad they're back on Dynamite. But they should have been telling this story like for the last three months on the show itself, but whatever. Um, I assume they win tonight, but I think it's already been confirmed that tag team title match is happening next week and not at the pay-per-view. You would think they would want to blow off SCU you know, at the pay-per-view. SCU's been together now for almost a decade. Christopher Daniels and Frankie Kazarian. You would think that they would get their title shot on pay-per-view. They're not. 
So um, I, I assume it's happening next week on the show. And then at the pay-per-view, we get the Young Bucks, Kingston, and um, Moxley in a tag team title match. And honestly, I think Moxley and Kingston win. Now, I say that having said that AEW has way too many tag teams. They have a lot of great tag teams, but you would think that they would want to build up one of their own tag teams and not do the makeshift shit again. We've already seen that with, you know, Paige and Omega. That was a different story. I like Moxley and Kingston being a tag team. If Moxley loses again, I don't know where the fuck you go with him from here. I feel like he loses a lot lately. He lost the Revolution. He lost the World Championship. He lost the Kenta and Omega, Moxley and... Archer tag team match a few months ago. He lost the six-man tag team match against Omega and the Bucks. He loses a lot on the show. Um, they, he needs to win at some point, so I feel like that would be it. I feel like it's going to be him and Kingston winning the tag titles from the Bucks. So that's one match. With Omega, again, I don't know. And who would that surprise be? Who would he face at the pay-per-view? Is someone from Impact a big enough name? I think it'd be cool as one of their biggest pay-per-views of the year, would that make sense? Not really. Like, I don't think they do Omega and Swan, for example, for the World Championship. I don't, I mean, considering they never even mentioned Rick Swan's name once on Dynamite at all, they mentioned Impact maybe once or twice, now that he's the World Champion. But they haven't mentioned Rick Swan's name specifically whatsoever. So I don't think Swan's a big enough name to put in that spot. You know, I know <sighs> Impact's doing that under siege pay-per-view main event where the winner gets the next shot at Omega's Impact World Title. Again, that has nothing to do with AEW. I feel like that's exclusive to Impact. I don't think Impact is going to have anything to do with Double or Nothing. I would love to see them involved in the pay-per-view. I don't think they will be, though. And now, you know, I've said Okada before. Again, is that a match you build up within a month's notice? Like, the pay-per-view's coming up in three or four weeks. You know, that's an option, I guess. Abushi now that he's freed up from New Japan's World Title maybe, but again, is that a match you build up in three or four weeks? I would say no, so I don't know what the fuck you do with Omega. Christian is an option. I feel like it's just too soon for that. He's only won two matches, and it feels it feels like he's currently in, in, embroiled in this rivalry with Team Taz anyway. Same thing with Adam Page. Adam Page just lost to Brian Cage, I and mean, well, even if Adam Page beat Cage last week, you know, Cage beat Page, and even if it was the other way around with Page beating Cage, I still wouldn't want to see Page getting the next title shot of the pay-per-view just because I feel like it's also too soon for that. So I feel like they're in a weird position with Omega right now where the reason why they're dragging out the Moxley shit is because they don't have anyone else ready. And this is the issue they run into when you don't build up enough credible baby faces. You have Cody Rhodes, but they wrote that they fucking booked themselves into a corner by doing the stipulation that we can never again go for the world championship, which I assume at some point will be broken. But, you know, I know he doesn't want to put this pressure on himself of like, oh, I don't want to make it seem like I'm putting the world belt on, on myself, whatever. But Omega's a fucking EVP too, so I don't really see what, what the difference is here. Well, what is the difference between Cody being the champion and Omega being the champion, aside from the fact that in the ring, Omega is better? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, that people would shit on Cody Rhodes for being champion. If he's over and it makes sense, then you fucking do it. For Omega, he's over, and it made sense to put the belt on him, so therefore, that's what they did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, anyway, I feel like Cody Rhodes would have been perfect for this spot, but because they did what they did, now he's feuding with fucking QT Marshall, the match that we're getting tonight on the show. So anyway, um, I don't know. I don't know what you do with Omega, but I do assume we get the Young Bucks, Moxley, and Kingston for the tag team titles. Obviously, Hikaru Shida and Britt Baker for the World Women's Championship for AEW. That's obviously a given. Uh, Best Friends versus Death Triangle also seems like a given. They've been building it up since uh, Death Triangle fully reunited recently, and Best Friends are cleared up of their feud with Miro and Sabian. So that would seem to make sense. Uh, Cody Rhodes, they mentioned him. He's facing QT tonight. So I don't think we get that at the pay-per-view, thank God. But I do think we get him in a go-go. They've been building up a go-go. Maybe a go-go goes over. I don't know. Um, I would think so, just to kind of make him a bigger deal. So I think that'll be the pay-per-view match. And then the fifth match, I think, is all but a given um, in some form or fashion. Darby Allen and Lance Archer versus Scorpio Sky. And, and um, I put Page down, but I'm always fucking confused. Is that Adam Page, Ethan Page? Ethan Page, obviously. Now, that doesn't sound like a killer match on paper, but it does make sense. Archer's been coming to the aid of Sting and Allen lately. Um, Sting could wrestle in the match. It's better than doing Sting and Archer one-on-one. -on -one. Unless Archer completely kills the guy, there's no real reason to do that match. So I don't think Sting needs to wrestle a double or nothing. So I think Darby and Archer as a tag team makes sense. 
Um, you know, there's no need to waste the Sting appearance if there n- not an appearance, but like a match. If there's no reason to, maybe they could do a six man with Alan Archer and Sting versus Sky Page and someone else, maybe like a Miro or something, and then Miro pins Alan, and that leads to him beating him for the belt or something. <clears throat> I guess that's an option, but Sky and Page is really the alliance they've been teasing lately, and I would be surprised if they did Alan and Sky one on one or Alan and Page one on one on pay per view. The championship is more of a TV title, to be honest with you. They didn't defend it back at all out either. So you don't absolutely need a TNT title match on your double or nothing pay-per-view. I'm, I'm, on, I'm honestly fine with the fact that it won't be defended at the show. They already have the women's championship, the world title, I would assume, the world tag team. So it doesn't really it doesn't really matter that much if the TNT title isn't defended. So I think it's going to be a tag team match. As far as, as far as other matches we could see, Matt Hardy's stable versus the Dark Order, I don't really care personally, but they've been building that up for a while. So maybe Matt Hardy, the Butcher, the Blade, and Private Party versus five members of Dark Order. That would seem to make sense. You could do Dustin Rhodes and Nick Camarado maybe in a bull rope match, which they've been teasing lately with Nick Camarado attacking Dustin with the rope. Um, maybe I like Camarado. Is that really a pay-per-view match? No, I would do that on Dynamite, if anything. Um, you know, they could do QT and Dustin in a bull rope match, maybe. Even that's not really a pay-per-view match, but at least they're former partners. Camarado being in there doesn't really make... He doesn't have that much experience to where I would put him in a singles match on pay-per-view. Let's put it that way. As far as other matches they could do, I mean, there's a, you know a couple other ones they've teased. You could also do um, Jericho and MJF. I know, obviously, we're getting blood and guts tonight, but you got to imagine that. MJF or Jericho is going to be on the pay-per-view. Maybe they'll do MJF and Sammy Guevara. That was really the feud, to be honest with you, that they were building up late last year was with MJF and Sammy. That never really went anywhere. Maybe they write Jericho off the show with an inner circle loss tonight with a pinnacle win. Jericho gets written off for a few weeks or a few months or whatever, and then MJF comes, or uh, Sammy Guevara steps up and faces Sammy at the pay-per-view, or Sammy steps up and faces MJF at the pay-per-view. I could see that. Um, there, there's a lot of matches they're teasing, but yes, it is weird. They have yet to announce anything officially in the pay-per-views are literally in like three weeks. I mean, that is typical WWE shit. At least they have stuff built up. I will say that, but to not even announce anything is a little, is a little strange. Definitely strange. His third uh, question here, or no, second question rather. That was his first question. Man, I spent a lot of time on that one. His second question, since it looks like we're starting to have a legitimate AEW New Japan Pro Wrestling partnership, can you name four AEW wrestlers that would be good to compete in the G1 Climax this year? Uh, here's the criteria. Two heels and two baby faces, no Kenny Omega, and no one is banged up so that they could legitimately wrestle through the tournament without limitations. Also, name the two in Block A and the two in Block B. This is so we know who the specific AEW versus AEW matchup in each block will be. Hmm. So this is what I would do. These are the four names that came to mind. I looked through the roster, kind of skim through it, kind of comb through the names on, on the AEW roster. These were the four names that came to mind. Moxley, who wasn't he in the G1 Climax two years ago? Because I feel like he lost to Yano or whatever. I feel like he was already in it, but him being back in it would make sense. He's their U.S. champion, and, you know, he's great anyway. So I would put Moxley back into it in Block A. Also in Block A, Miro. I feel like he'd be very cool to see in New Japan. If he was still around, then Brody Lee. I think Brody Lee would have been fucking awesome over in Japan. Uh, it's a shame that, you know, he wasn't able to do it before he passed, rest in peace. But, you know, Miro taking that spot. So Moxley and Miro and Block A, I, they, I'm sure they had a match or two in WWE. I don't remember many matches between the two, but that could be a lot of fun in uh, in New Japan. And Block B, um, I, I'm, I'm considering him a heel. Miro is a heel, Mox is a face. So in Block B is a heel, Pack. I don't know if he's ever been in the G1 Climax before. I know he's been in Japan before. I don't know if he was ever doing New Japan shit. I don't really... I wasn't following his career too closely before WWE. So Pack in there would be fucking awesome. And then for the babyface, Jungle Boy. I think Jungle Boy in the G1 Climax could be a lot of fun. He's been killing it lately in AEW. So uh, Moxley and Miro on Block A. And then Block B, Jungle Boy in Pack. His third question, do you think Raw would get better if one day in front of a Pack crowd on one of those more awful than usual Raw shows, the audience loudly chanted, this show sucks, for the entire three hours nonstop. I mean, they literally crapped on everything, including good segments, 
Uh, or, I mean, they literally just crap on everything, including good segments, just to prove a point. I mean, I wouldn't shit on good segments. I mean, that's not fair to the superstars. And honestly, as a viewer watching at home, it would be like hearing the chant nonstop for three hours would be worse than the show itself, personally. Um, I mean, some of the some of the crowd chants get out of control. I think the equivalent to that would be when they hijack the shows, the post WrestleMania shows, and we've been seeing it a lot more in recent years. The problem with the crowd hijacking is that people go overboard with it. And when you just when you just chant this show sucks or boo everything or whatever, you're giving these people what they want because they want audience interaction. When you're just silent for the entire show, or at least the segments are, that are no good, that'll send more of a message that what is going on isn't working. Because when Vince hears cheers or boos or chants, it doesn't matter what the fuck it is, it's audience participation. So if you're just chanting this show sucks for three hours, which how anyone could do that for three hours straight, God bless you. I've been in front of those crowds before. It's just fucking annoying sometimes. No matter how bad the show is, me as a viewer or me being there in person, this is just me. This is probably not popular opinion. That would bother the shit out of me. That would make me never want to go to a show again, less so than watch Raw, for as bad as Raw is. So no, I don't think that would change anything. And they would also edit it if they even wanted to on their YouTube videos and on Peacock and on the network and shit. They could do whatever the fuck they want. They control the narrative, so... I really don't think that would change anything. But again, I think the best way to send a message would be to just not make any noise at all. We've already seen the crowd hijacking stuff after WrestleMania and in front of random audiences. And, you know, it's funny, but again, people take it too far. People take the crowd hijacking shit and shit on stuff that should not be shit on. Like, I remember a very good Neville in, what was it, Mustafa Ali match after WrestleMania a few years ago. The The crowd shit all over it. I know they don't give a fuck about the Cruiserweights, but it's like, these people do not deserve that. They deserve better than that. I thought that was complete shit. If you want to poop on, like, the Roman Reigns segment or whatever, go right the fuck ahead. But, like, with the shit that actually deserves it, it's not proving a point. It's just being an asshole. So, again, that's just me. I I would not condone that at all. If you really want to prove a point, you just don't watch the show. And people are like, oh, that's, you know, one viewer is not going to make a difference. It actually fucking does because there are enough people who hate Raw right now that aren't watching to the point where the Raw ratings are worse than they've ever been. So for all the people that are like, oh, yeah, go ahead and tune out. Like, they don't need you anyway. Honestly, and there has been enough of those people where the Raw ratings are in the fucking toilet. And it's not even like the, the ratings are shit because the damage has been done, but the show is actually good. No, the show is still creatively shit. It's not like they turned things around and attempted to make strides. Yeah, this show is this week's show is a slightly marginally better show than usual, but that's not saying much when you have just dog shit shows for weeks and months and almost years on end. So just don't watch the show or don't go to the show or whatever. Cancel your Peacock or network account depending on where you live. I mean, that shit, to me, sends more of a message than going there and saying that the show sucks. Because to me, that ain't gonna change shit. Unless you're just completely quiet, which is what they hate. They like the audience participation, so I'm sure they would absolutely encourage that. And spin it into their own narrative anyway. Next question from Noel from Facebook. Thoughts on Eva Marie coming back to WWE. Uh, We knew this was coming because it was reported late last year. And I will say Eva did improve marginally in the ring during her time in NXT. I actually enjoy the NXT run from her, and I was also digging the stuff she was doing before she left. I almost wish at that point she didn't leave, because what they were doing with her at that point, where she would like have her debut match, but she wouldn't actually wrestle, I thought was great, because her strong suit is not fucking wrestling. If they were to bring her back, and maybe they'll prove me wrong, but if they were to bring her back as a manager, for someone honestly like an Angel Garza, I think that would be great. Because Angel Garza is like this Lothario anyway. And um, they were doing all those weird-ass segments last year where Angel Garza was talking to like this mystery lover and giving her roses. I thought that would be Eva Marie, and I really like that idea. I think Eva Marie being a manager for someone because she attracts heat and, you know, people just genuinely do not like Eva Marie just because she's terrible. Then I think that would be cool. But if she's going to be in the ring as a member of the women's roster then it's it's going to be a train wreck. It's almost fitting, actually. With how bad Raw is right now, and with how bad specifically that Raw women's division is right now, and I hate saying that because we have Rhea Ripley as champion, which is cool. Asuka is in the mix. Charlotte is great. I don't know what the fuck they're doing with this whole Sonya Deville, 
suspension shit. That I just I don't care about it. Um, but at least they have a couple, they have a lot of women that are very good, but they book these women like shit. The tag titles are just completely pointless. Nia Jax sucks. Shayna has never meant less. Lana is awful. Dana Brooke is not good. Mandy Rose, compared to where she was a year ago, has fallen very, very far. Um, Naomi means nothing, even though she is very good as well. She deserves an opportunity. It's embarrassing to look at that division and to see what it's become. There has been a regression in women's wrestling, specifically in Raw, really the entire company, since Ronda Rousey left two years ago. And they never really recovered. And Becky leaving obviously wasn't good for them. Um, you know, again, they have Charlotte and Asuka's been holding down the four, but they never really made Asuka, an, an, you know, much of a priority. They booked her like shit when she was champion. She was never defending the belt on pay-per-view. She was hardly ever on Raw. No memorable feuds. Rhea's been booked a little bit better. Her promos are just not good for what they're giving her. Um, and the Asuka matches were slightly underwhelming, but she's not ruined yet. But she's still one of the more special women on that entire show compared to the rest of the roster. How bad is that? So adding Eva Marie to the mix does nothing. There's absolutely fucking nothing to switch things up. To get rid of Peyton Royce and Mickey James and people that could actually make a difference if you booked them properly, and to bring back someone who is notoriously awful in the ring, to me is just a mind-blowing decision. I don't hate Eva Marie. I think in the right role she could work. But if you are bringing her back to wrestle and face Rhea Ripley for the Raw Women's Championship, we are all fucking doomed. Their second question, with Daniel Bryan being free, do you see him staying in WWE or do you see the American Dragon going to a different wrestling company? So here's the million dollar question coming out of the news last night that Bryan is officially a free agent coming off the Roman Reigns match on SmackDown. And by the way, the fact that WWE, and I tweeted this this morning, the fact that WWE was still putting this guy in main events, even though they knew his contract was coming up, is amazing to me. They literally put him in the main event of SmackDown his last night in the company. I know with Moxley, they didn't really bury him on the way out, but you got it, it. It's a tale of two people. And the thing with Moxley is that he wasn't even like a bad performer. Like Moxley is very, very good. It seemed like he was well liked in the company. Maybe it's because they couldn't, they knew they couldn't convince Ambrose to leave or to stay, rather. So they were like, listen, let's just give him the whatever treatment on the way out. And they openly acknowledged on the show that he was on his way out. Brian, we didn't know that. He has said before he could be considering other options and his contract was coming up this year. We didn't know it was on fucking Friday. <laughs> you know, we all thought it was later on in the year um, on, on Friday itself, which would have been, what, May 1st? This contract expired May 1st? That's that's amazing. Is it May 1st or no? What was... when? Today's the 5th. Monday was the 3rd. No, it was April 30th. Okay, so his contract expired on April 30th going into May 1st is what it was. So anyway, um, the fact they were still putting him in main events, in, in the fucking main event of WrestleMania, I think goes to show how great of a person he is, how well-liked he is in that company, how badly they want him to stay, and how awesome a performer he is. Because otherwise, I mean, again, Moxley is great, and they obviously wanted him to stay with AEW starting up at that point. But they just didn't give a fuck. They booked the guy to lose a lot. He wasn't even at WrestleMania. He wasn't on Raw the last couple of weeks he was there. You know, with Brian, I mean, it, it's it's amazing. I mean, they were still putting him on the show. He was involved in the Universal Championship mix. He was involved in great matches. They weren't booking him to lose all the time. He was doing some pretty big shit every, week after week. That, that, that's pretty crazy to me. It honestly reminds me of CM Punk. Like, they were putting this guy in main events of fucking pay-per-views and notable matches on his way out. He wasn't losing a lot on his way out. Before his contract, I mean, I'm not talking 2014, I'm talking 2011, before he was supposed to leave the first time. Um, But anyway, going back to where he goes, do I see him staying? At this point, I don't. I honestly don't. If you asked me a week ago, and I've said this before, I did. When his contract came due, I figured he would re-sign, stick around, play the field, and he still could do this, and, you know, stay and re-sign and whatever. The fact he's a free agent is a big deal, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to AEW automatically. At this juncture, I do think he's not coming back right now. Could he take a couple months to just hang the fuck out and then come back in a couple months? Yes, but for what, though, is the question. If he comes back on a part-time basis, I I don't know. I feel like if he really wanted to stay, he would have just extended the contract and even then signed the part-time deal. Like, we're five days out. He hasn't re-signed yet, as far as we know. I don't know. I could see this going any number of ways. I could see him 
Honestly, I do think he will go elsewhere, if only just to test the waters and have some matches that he's always wanted to have, and maybe not sign a contract and then come back to WWE, because you know for a fucking fact they would welcome him back with open arms and kiss his ass and whatever, because it's Daniel Bryan, you know what I mean? He's a big deal, even in 2021. They're not just going to be like, oh, you work for that other company? We won't want you back. Like, no, they, they will absolutely, if he was to go, it's... It's honestly like he just left his girlfriend, and he, I mean, I all due respect to Brie Bella, it's like he left his girlfriend, went to go sleep with other women, and then the, the, the original girlfriend was so desperate, she'll welcome him back because she knows that he, he's one of the best that she'll ever get. I'm not saying Daniel Bryan is the, the absolute guy. Like, if Roman Reigns was to leave, that's a bigger deal because he's like the face of the company. You know, WWE will rebound, will rebound if they lose Daniel Bryan permanently, They'll always, you know, make up for every loss that they have. That's still a pretty big loss to another company, because WWE's loss isn't only their loss, it's another company's gain, specifically AEW, if that's where he goes. They're going to try everything they can to get this guy back in WWE. I think at this point, though, he might go elsewhere. I don't think he's going to AEW absolutely, 120%. I think there's a good chance. But in talking to Brian myself, and you can check out the interview we did two months ago, less than two months ago, um, right before Fastlane for Bleacher Report, the audio is here on the channel in the interviews tab. We talked extensively about his contract if he had gone to AEW a couple of years ago. He didn't answer that question specifically. You know, he just kind of talked about, oh, what I, what I wish I would have done on the way out, blah, 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 all this other shit. Um, but he also mentioned all these matches he wanted to have in New Japan, in AEW, even in Ring of Honor, even in NXT. So that's the thing. If he was to re-sign the WWE... What do you do with him? Yeah, he's a part-timer like Edge, but it's WWE. They could always work their way around it, but like, do you put him right back on SmackDown? I wouldn't, because it defeat, it, def- it completely defeats the purpose of doing the stipulation in the first place, of having him banished from the blue brand. So I would keep him around. Um, I, I would keep him around in the company if I was WWE, but I wouldn't put him right back on SmackDown. So again, what is he re-signing for? Is he re-signing for Raw? Holy shit, that would be one of the dumbest things ever. With how terrible Raw is right now, Daniel Bryan, unless the deal, unless the deal is astronomically, you know, he would be just incredibly dumb to turn it down, then I don't know why you would re-sign the WWE just to stick with Raw. I mean, honestly, there's a couple matches for him to be had there, but seriously, like, for him to stay on Raw would be terrible. Would they re-sign him to a big money deal to put him right on NXT? I honestly don't think so. NXT, for as great of a show as it is, is still the C show in WWE. It's not Raw, and it's not SmackDown. Quality-wise, it's the A show, in my opinion. But it's also still their developmental brand. I think had he had his contract go, it went until August, and he just wanted to kind of, you know, he wanted to fill some time between now and August, or now and September, whenever his contract we thought was going to expire. Then they put him on NXT... That I could see, like that I would understand, but he would have to physically re-sign to come back for NXT, and they would have to put him on a big money deal. Now, there's a lot of matches for him to be had in NXT with with Daniel Bryan in NXT, but he could also have equally exciting, if not even better matches in AEW, because it's not under the WWE banner. I feel like we hear this all the fucking time from people, when people do these interviews about how... When they try to resign this talent, they promise them a deal in NXT. And they're like, no, we just need to, we need to get, as much as I love NXT, I need to get the fuck out of here. I need to go elsewhere in order to come back. I mean, I heard Matt Hardy talking about it. Yeah, they even offered Matt Hardy a fucking deal in NXT, which is the absolute weirdest fit. Um, I, I think he would have made it work, but, you know, they offered Matt Hardy a deal in NXT when his contract was coming up. They offered, I think, Brody Lee a deal in NXT before before they let him go. And they said, hey, would you like to go back to NXT? He was like, no. Um, or maybe he asked to go back. I don't know. And it just nothing ever came from it. He They asked him to go back to NXT. Even Andrade just recently, they were like, hey, let's go back to NXT for a year. Evaluate your status. He's like, no, I just need to be out of here permanently. You know what I mean? Like, I've been there, done that. I've been in NXT, I've been the champion. It's time for me to go elsewhere. I feel like they're going to ask Daniel Bryan to do the same thing. And he's going to be like, no. NXT is a great show, but there are just as good shows, if not better shows, out there. So my current prediction is that he does test the waters with else other companies, and we see him show up in Japan, we see him show up in AEW, possibly. You know, he doesn't have this undying allegiance to WWE. They've done a lot for him and his family, 
But I, again, I can see, absolutely see him going elsewhere. And then, because he didn't come up in WWE. You know, like an edge, like if he was to go to AEW when he came to the ring, when he came back to the ring, that to me would be a little shitty. Just because, you know, he, he started up in WWE, it makes more sense for him to go back to WWE. A Sting, for example, like him going to AEW doesn't really matter to me, just because, I mean, it's cool, but like, he, he came up in WCW. WWE was never really his home. And Daniel Bryan's in the same way. He's been there for 10 years, yeah, but he also came up in the independent scene. That's really where he got started. So he doesn't have this allegiance to WWE. He can go wherever the fuck he wants, and he knows deep down business is, or Bryan is not a dumb man. He's a very smart business guy. He could go elsewhere, and they'll still ask him to come back. So why not? Why not try it? He's not burning any bridges. They will always ask him to come back. So we'll see what happens with him. No, I don't think he's going to show up on Dynamite tonight. He could, hey, you know, you never fucking know. You never know. But the fact that we have Samoa Joe and Andrade and Brian all free agents right now is incredible. I mean, it's just amazing. So um, we'll see what they do. We'll, we'll see what happens with Daniel Bryan. And uh, I'm very excited to see what the future holds for him. I do, again, at the end of the day. At this point, I wouldn't have said this a week ago, but currently, now that he is a free agent, I think he might go somewhere else. And again, it could be a Drew Gulak situation whose contract expired and then he re-signed like a couple days later. Um, Daniel Bryan could be the same case, but he's a much bigger name. If Daniel Bryan can get a better deal elsewhere and be part-time and, you know, have those creatively stifling matches or uh, st- stimulating matches, then I think he would uh, He would definitely do it. At Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter Machine. Check out a show on YouTube. Real Honesty with John Ritland. His first question was... So Raw had a guy shove a rose uh, down another guy's tights and then kick it up his ass. In my 36 years of watching wrestling, in my 36 plus years of watching wrestling, I've never seen, I've never seen that and never wanted to. Seriously, what the hell? Yeah, that was absolutely probably, maybe not the biggest low point from Raw this week, which again is saying something, but it's got to be up there. That Garza Gulak shit, I mean, the match was, was fine, but the post-match shit was just fucking weird. I mean, that was bizarre. I don't even know why why you would do that or why you would even think of doing that. It's such a Vince McMahon thing. You know him and Bruce in the back were probably, you know, just yakking it up and dying of laughter. Holy shit, that was dumb. Um, His second question, so this Nightmare Family versus Nightmare Factory feud sure isn't working out so well, is it? It's it's really not, in my opinion. It's really not. I, I don't give a fuck about QT Marshall. I don't give a fuck about Aaron Solo. I don't give a fuck about Lee Johnson. I mean, these guys seem talented, at least Lee Johnson. I don't think I'll ever, I don't think I will ever care about QT Marshall or Aaron Solo. Aaron Solo is better in the ring, but he screams generic indie guy. Nick Camarado at least has some size on his side. He's got a great look. There is literally nothing special about QT Marshall or Aaron Solo. I'm sorry. Uh, Lee Johnson has got some personality, it seems. I like him. Um, who else is involved in this dumb thing? The, the Anthony Agogo guy, he seems pretty cool. You know, he, he's a boxer. He's got a boxing background, and he's got some legitimacy to him. I think he has potential. The whole feud, the, the whole faction shit, I don't give a fuck what their excuse was. Oh, New Japan does it, so we'll do it too. It, dude, it, it doesn't work like that. Just because it works for New Japan, and quite honestly, I don't watch New Japan, but even if I did, I fucking hate the faction shit there too. I think it's even worse in AEW because with, with New Japan, it's done differently. They don't have a weekly show where every fucking week these factions are coming out having 10-man tag team matches. I mean, they're, they're structured a bit differently over in Japan where they have the big shows every month and the daily events and day ones and whatever. I, I don't know. I don't watch the product, so maybe, I'll, maybe I would watch and be like, wow, this shit is getting old real quick. But it just doesn't work. It doesn't work in AEW, in my opinion. And no, it's not a matter of taste. It, it's a taste thing, but I just think and just shoving 75 people on the fucking show is not going to get anyone over. I saw Jericho trying to defend in some interview he did a couple days ago. He was like, oh, yeah, you know, you said we have 75 people on the show, but that, that, that's people that wouldn't be on the show otherwise. That's the fucking point, dude. That's the fucking point. Aaron Solo and QT Marshall should not be on Dynamite. They shouldn't be. You don't need to have factions for the sake of fucking having factions. I honestly care less about these people when they get involved in these alliances. What the, sh- what the fuck is the point of Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page forming a team when they were literally just in a tag team a month ago? They never even bothered to explain what happened with SCU and Sky. They just ignored that it ever happened. 
And they've been together for like years. That was weird. And then with Ethan Page, he literally left one company. The guy's not that special anyway. I like Ethan Page, but he's not this extraordinary main event talent. But for him to leave one company and one tag team, to go to another t- to go to another company and another tag team, just to me makes absolutely no sense. And people just let this fly by because it's 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 AEW. WWE does this shit too, and it happens all the fucking time. Literally, I mean, let, oh, here's a per- here's a perfect example. Otis, why break up heavy machinery when? We have Gable and Otis now. Why break them up to put him in just another tag team? We complain about that as as we should because there was no reason to break up heavy machinery. Now, this is in the same situation because Ethan Page went from one company to the next. But why would you bring in a guy that just got out of a tag team and put him in another fucking tag team? That is the absolute dumbest if, if, if he has potential on his own. AEW needs more of a mid-card scene. I hate the tag teams. I hate the fucking alliances. I hate the factions and the stables and the wars. I can, I can deal with blood and guts, because at least that makes sense. The elite shit, the fact they're still jerking off the Bullet Club nonsense all these years later, to me is just annoying. I like the Bullet Club too, that's the thing, I've never been one of these people that always hates the Bullet Club. I like, the, I like everyone involved in that group, but the fact they're still fucking doing this goes to show how much of a fucking mark Tony Khan can be. I mean, how much do casual viewers really give a shit about the Bullet Club drama? I, I would almost guarantee you virtually nobody. The diehard fans probably will, oh, you, whatever. Like, but with the fucking people that tune into the show every week, you know, as, as casual viewers that are looking for something new to watch, probably don't give a shit about the Bullet Club being back together. If it's leading somewhere, then cute. But if it's not, then who cares? And the thing is, is that it's my, even if it is leading somewhere, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be somewhere good. That's the problem. The fact we're, I mean, again, this goes to show I love long-term storytelling. AEW does a lot of good long-term storytelling. But just the fact that you have a long-term story doesn't make it a good, long, doesn't make it good. Moxley and Omega have been feuding for six months. We have to move on from this. We've got to move on. Just because they've been feuding for six months doesn't make it, doesn't make it this classic feud. Honestly, it it's, it's really has been nothing special for me at all. Um, the matches have been pretty good. But they're not great enough to warrant the fact that it's been lasting a half of a fucking year. We have to move on from this shit at some point. Omega needs new challengers. They need to build up more stars. And I literally just said this earlier. They don't have many singles baby faces. Cody Rhodes is one of the few single credible baby faces they have. And he can't be in the main event because that dumb stipulation they put in place a couple of years ago. You know, the Darby-Sting relationship, that tag team thing, I'm fine with because he's more of a mentor to Darby. Sting shouldn't be on the show every week. That's a mistake. He doesn't feel special at all at this point. But I, I can deal with that. But like everyone else and their mother being in a goddamn tag team does nothing for me. Oh my, why, why do Butcher and the Bleed have to be part of this Matt Hardy stable? I mean, why? Can't they just have Matt Hardy in private party? Isn't that enough? Butcher and Blade are just, they're, as characters, they're terrible. They've had some pretty good matches since coming back, but like, or since coming to AEW, but... I don't give a fuck about their characters. I love the Dark Order, and then they're very entertaining. But why should I give a shit about this feud aside from the fact that it's built into an inevitable 10-man tag team match? You know, I, just, I feel like AEW has a lot more problems creatively than people kind of let on. Um, I, I know I've gone completely off the grid here with my thoughts on Nightmare Family and Nightmare Factory, but like we literally have three different faction feuds going on in the company right now. For a two-hour show, that's ridiculous. Two, maybe. Three is overkill. And two of the feuds aren't even that good. I love Matt Hardy, but his feud, or his faction versus the Dark Order, I don't don't give a shit. Honestly, Adam Page is one of the few people I actually really like in AEW and Christian, too, because they're not associated. I mean, they have Page with the Dark Order, but he's not in a tag team right now. He's on his own, flying solo, telling his own story. Same thing with Christian Cage. I really like that. We need more people on their own doing that shit. None of this faction garbage. The Nightmare Family and the Nightmare Factory is terrible. It's not getting anyone over. Cody Rhodes feels completely wasted. I mean, this feels like it's a, a, a D-level program for an A-list talent. Cody Rhodes has fallen far from where I was a year ago. They just bounce him around or he bounces himself around because he is writing this shit, I would assume, or helping book it or whatever. He is an EVP. He's bouncing around from random feud to random feud with no real direction at all. QT, Mar- QT Marshall is awful. 
And then half of the other guys aren't established at all. We know nothing about half of these other guys, aside from that Aaron Solo used to be Bailey's fucking boyfriend. And that's literally it. Nick Camarado used to be in WWE. Why else should I give a shit about these people? <sighs> Rant over. Next question. Uh, Non-wrestling related, from uh, John as well. If you saw the new Mortal Kombat movie, what did you think of it? I felt it was a lot of setup for a few decent moments, but overall it felt like filler. You know, I haven't seen it. Not yet, anyway. Now, I have had a few people ask me if I've seen it. So, the question is, if I am not at all familiar with Mortal Kombat, like, I, I literally have not played the games whatsoever, aside from, like, the occasional arcade shit. If I have very little knowledge of Mortal Kombat, should I watch the movie as a movie? I, I, I've had people say, oh, you don't need to know the characters to enjoy it, blah, blah, blah. I've seen mixed reviews so that's why I haven't gone out of my way to watch it. For example, the Snyder Cut, I don't really give a shit about the DC stuff for the most part. I saw the original Justice League, so I thought I would watch the Snyder Cut, despite the fact it was four hours, which is just stupid. and had no business being that long. I'm like, okay, I'll check it out, whatever, a lot of buzz. The Mortal Kombat stuff doesn't really seem to have a lot of buzz. So unless it's a movie that I'm really looking forward to, like Nobody, for example, I haven't seen a lot of people talk about it, but I saw that last week in a theater, and it was fucking awesome. And I love Christopher Lloyd, so... That was another re- another reason why I went to go see it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Let me know. If it's a movie that you think I should see anyway, despite the fact I really know nothing about the Mortal Kombat stuff, let me know and I'll watch it. Because I've had a couple people ask me about it. And usually if enough people ask me about it, I'll watch it anyway, just to see what the buzz is about. So that that's the thing. It feels like it does have some, I guess it has enough buzz for people to be asking me whether I saw it. I guess that's what I'm trying to say here. So let me know. No, I haven't seen it yet. But if you said it felt like filler, then I probably won't. If, 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 you're, if you're saying that it's a waste of time to watch for someone who's never seen the Mortal Kombat stuff before, then thank you for letting me know ahead of time because I won't bother wasting time watching it. I, I, I don't have a lot of time to watch movies, so I like to make the time that I do have to watch movies matter, if that makes sense. I'm at noob underscore n underscore co 1991. Uh, kind of on the same subject. What are your thoughts on the official titles for Black Panther 2 and Captain Marvel 2, now being called Black Panther 2 Wakanda Forever, and the Marvels, and what will be the story for both movies? I assume Captain Marvel 2 will deal with Miss Marvel, who has her own show coming up. I don't know a lot about that at all, but I assume that she'll be in it. Um, Monica Rambeau, I assume, will be in it. That's the daughter, right, from WandaVision and not her mom? Mm, that might be the mom. The woman that was also in WandaVision, the daughter. I forgot her name already, but uh, that might that might be her name. But I assume that she'll be in it, and obviously Brie Larson's character, Captain Marvel herself. I don't know what else it would be about. I, I don't know if it's taking place present day, or if it's taking place between the time frame of like the mid-90s when the first movie took place, and then you know present day. I feel like it could be another prequel, but I could be wrong. As far as the, what was the other one, Black Panther 2, obviously, probably, you know, I don't know if it'll be about Chadwick Boseman's death, like, uh, who's going to fill the role of the Black Panther, or if it's just, that's going to be like a side story in the beginning, and then they just do a completely different story. I don't know what I want to see, to be honest with you, I really don't know. Um, You know, I've seen people say, who should be the next Black Panther, should it be Shuri, or Killmonger, Killmonger died, I mean, I guess they could bring him back, maybe, you know, I I would like to see Black Panther be the other guy, I like Shuri, I don't really see her being a good Black Panther, personally, I think she's just good in the role that she's in, the other guy, I don't remember his name, the guy that, um, that T'Challa, you know, had, had fought at the beginning of the movie, beat his ass, and then they ended up aligning at the end, he was also in Infinity War, Again, I don't remember his name, but maybe he could be the next Black Panther. I don't know. I don't really know what each movie is going to be about, but I assume the second Black Panther movie will be about Chadwick Boseman's character's uh, passing, or at least incorporate that. Again, I don't know if it's going to be a side thing, or maybe they don't say he dies. Maybe they just say that he went off on a different adventure and he's not coming back. I don't know. I have no clue, but I I didn't really give a shit about Captain Marvel 1. I thought it was good. Not great. Definitely one of the weaker Captain, or one of the weaker MCU movies I've seen recently in recent years. So I'm kind of looking more forward to Wakanda forever, to be honest with you, than I am the Marvels. Um, Let's see, your second question. What are your thoughts on the way? Um, Is it improving Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae's characters, as well as Austin Theory and Indy Hartwell too, or is it just a comedy act and Johnny and Candice are way overdue to join the main roster? I see what you did there, and that was clever. 
you know, I enjoy the way. I've seen mixed reactions on it. Some people hate it. Some people love it. You know, I'm in the camp that actually really enjoys it. Um, if you hate it, that's totally fine. I really enjoy Johnny Gargano and Candice. I think putting Theory in there and Indy really helps them out, gets them more exposure, puts them in a prominent role in the show. Indy and Candice, as of now, are the new NXT Women's Tag Team Champions, which is really cool. So I love that. Um, the Dexter stuff has been well done. I think it's been a fun story to tell in recent weeks. They also have the Bronson story going on. You got Theory and Cross next week. So they're involved in a lot of stories on the show. They're a pretty prominent presence. And honestly, it's probably one of the best. It's probably the best thing that Johnny Gargano has done since losing the NXT Championship two years ago, in my opinion. Because I feel like what he was doing, like he was bouncing before from feud to feud without really doing anything, and he was just losing a lot. Like he lost in every fucking takeover. He lost the North American title shots like every time. So I'm glad he's had a lengthy run. I assume he'll lose to Bronson Reed whenever they have that rematch at some point, which is good because Bronson Reed, you know, should get a run of the championship in my opinion. But yeah, um, I, I've enjoyed it. I enjoy the stable. If you don't, that's fine. Um, they are definitely a comedy act, but you know, I find it funny. Austin Theory making like a boob joke yesterday with uh, Scarlet was stupid. But other than that, I enjoy what they do most of the time. Um, your third question, who do you think Alexa Bliss and Lily should go after in the women's division based on last night's Raw, where we learned that Lily's favorite color is red? Uh, which female superstar has the color red on Raw? Uh, and who, who will they go after, Charlotte Flair or Sonya Deville? Now, I think Sonya wore red on Monday. And it looked like that Lily was eyeing uh, with Sonya backstage in that one of those segments that someone pointed out on Twitter. So maybe she is going after Sonya. It seems like Sonya is doing something with Charlotte, so I really don't know. I don't think they even have a fucking clue, to be honest with you. I think they're just filming these promos and vignettes with Alexa because they don't know what else to do with her right now. And we haven't seen Bray since. Whatever. Um, I, I don't really know. I know, obviously, Eva Marie used to be all red everything, but I don't think she has red hair anymore. I don't think she had red hair in that clip. That, I think she had, like, purple hair, right? In that clip in the vignette where she was reintroduced on Monday. I mean, that would still be a terrible feud. Alexa Bliss and Eva Marie, holy shit, that sounds awful. Uh, and I like Alexa Bliss, but th- she has to be paired up with the right person. Eva Marie is not that person. So I don't really know. I don't know what you do with uh, Lily and Alexa Bliss. You know, they've already beaten the Nikki Cross thing into the ground, and Nikki hasn't been on Raw in months anyway, so who gives a shit? Uh, I-, I don't know. There really isn't... I, I don't know. I don't know, because the Raw women's division right now is such a fucking mess. Like, I guess her and Ripley would make sense. Maybe. They already kind of did Alexa and Oscar earlier this year. I guess you could go back to that. Her and Sonya, maybe. But honestly, I'd rather see Sonya on SmackDown. SmackDown needs far more women than Raw does right now. They need the variety over on Friday nights. Natalia and Tamina are not fucking cutting it. Um, especially after the releases of Mickey and Billy and people like that. They need women on SmackDown. So... I, I hope Sonya stays on SmackDown. If she goes to Raw, maybe she'll feud with Charlotte. As far as Lily is concerned, I have no idea. I really don't. I don't. I don't honestly think they have any idea where this is going yet. I think they're just making shit up on the fly. And the reason why she said her favorite color was red was because she'll be on Raw. That's my assumption. Will WWE write off Asuka off of TV uh, following WrestleMania backlash? This will give Asuka six months to get her teeth fixed. And WWE will bring back the fans and enough time for the Charlotte feud or the Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley feud. She could. I haven't gotten the sense that Asuka is leaving TV anytime soon. I don't really know. Um, I, I, honestly, I don't really care either. Just because the Raw Women's Division, she, Asuka was hardly on Raw while the Women's Champion. So the fact that she isn't champion anymore, it doesn't make a lick of a difference. I'm just... And the thing is with Asuka, I'm a very big fan of Asuka. At this point, though, I just don't care. I just have Asuka fatigue. She's been all over the show. They've booked her not very well recently. She hasn't been involved in anything great in a long time. Um, you know, the, the, the Bailey and Sasha matches were good, but they ran that shit into the ground last year. I don't know. Asuka leaving, I haven't heard anything about her taking time off extensively, but that probably would be the best thing for them. Now, they need better workers in that division while she's gone. Um, and it is a blow to the division in a certain respect, but I do think she would benefit from going away for a little while because she's always been there, and they just never really figured out what to do with her. So honestly, I would rather see her leave for a couple of months or a couple of weeks or whatever and then come back, maybe refreshed, maybe, but I don't know. I just I just don't really care about uh, the Asuka character right now. So if she leaves, 
nice. If she doesn't, whatever. To me, it doesn't really matter either way. I don't really get the sense that she is leaving uh, to get her teeth fixed. I feel like she could be on the show anyway. Didn't we hear that Charlotte was getting dental surgery and that was why she was suspended, but she ended up sticking around anyway? <laughs> Isn't that what we heard? Like, I don't know. I guess we'll find out soon. Uh, final two questions from at the average grunt from Twitter. What do Bob Backlund, Diesel, Stone Cold, Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit, Batista, John Cena, The Miz, and Seth Rollins all have in common? And do you think we'll ever see the inverse of this? I've thought about this a lot since you sent this in last night. I don't know what they have in common. I don't. Um, Bob Backlund being in there is weird because... Uh, I don't know, because I'm thinking, oh, maybe because they're all Triple Crown winners or whatever. Bob Backlund wasn't neither a Cena or Batista. I I don't know. Maybe that they have, like, I, I'm not sure. Or, like, that they won a championship in the main event of WrestleMania, like Miz did or Benoit did or Batista did and Cena. Um, Backlund was never in the WrestleMania main event, so that wouldn't be it. I don't know what you're referring to. The fact that they lost championships like quickly, because I don't think Jericho ever had like a day long reign as as world champion. I guess maybe. Um, I don't know. I really, I'm not really sure. I, I I thought about this a lot. I'm thinking, what do these guys all have in common? Like the fact the fact they all won the triple crown quickly, like they didn't, because Backlund and Cena never did, or Batista. Oh man, I don't know. The fact they all had long title runs, because Backlund did and Diesel. Um, you know, Benoit had a couple month run as champion. I'm not really sure. You'd have to tell me. I don't know what they all have in common. You got me stumped. I'm not sure. His last question was, um, which one of these now retired titles had the best pay-per-view swan song? The World Heavyweight, the Women's, which lasted from 1956 to 2010, the World Tag Team titles, the European Championship, the Hardcore Championship, the Light Heavyweight Championship, or the Cruiserweight Championship from 02 to 07. So the final matches with these retired titles are the World Heavyweight, which was the main event of TLC 2013 with Cena and Orton, the undisputed ladder match. The women's last pay-per-view match was Melina and Michelle McCool, the Unification match with the Divas Championship and Nata Champions 2010. Um, The World Tag Team is wrong. You said here Crime Time versus Cody... Yeah, I guess that's correct. Crime Time, Cody Rhodes, and Ted DiBiase at Unforgiven 08. I consider Miz and Morrison versus Primo and Epico at WrestleMania 25 to be it. I know it was the pre-show. I mean, but still, that was the last. It happened on a pay-per-view. Excuse me. And it did technically count because the titles changed hands. Um, And then they unified the belt from there. So either way, that wouldn't be my pick. Um, European was Jeff Hardy and William Regal at Vengeance 02. The hardcore was Maven and Goldust. At WrestleMania 18, light heavyweight was Tajiri and X-Pac at SummerSlam 01, and the cruiserweight was at Great American Bash 07. I'm not even sure what the discrepancy is in here. I'm not even sure what the discrepancy is with this question. This is an absolute fucking, you know, softball of a question here. It's clearly the Great American Bash 07 cruiserweight championship being won by Hornswoggle. No, I'm kidding. It's obviously the ladder match with Cena and Orton at TLC 2013. Like, every other match that you mentioned, I either honestly don't remember at all, or it just wasn't very good. Like, I know Cena and Orton did not have the greatest TLC match of all time, but it was the main event of a pay-per-view that made it out to be a big deal. Um, Orton won. It was a pretty good match. It wasn't a bad match. It was a pretty good match. I mean, that's obviously it, because look, look at the rest of the matches that you named. Melina Michelle McCool in Night of Champions 2010 was not very good. Uh, if, we're, if we're counting Crime Time versus Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase, it was decent at best. And we're not counting the WrestleMania 25 match. And even that was good, but I wouldn't put that over the Cena and Orton match. Hardy and Regal, I don't remember at all. Maven and Goldust, I don't remember at all. Tajiri and X-Pac, I don't remember at all. And the Great American Bash, whatever the fuck it was, the Cruiserweight Open was won by Hornswoggle. That tells you everything you need to know. So clearly it is seen in Orton having the best pay-per-view swan song for the retired World Heavyweight Championship. And that's going to do it, guys, for this episode of Hashtag Ask GSM on May 5th, 2021, uh, episode 388. Thank you, as always, for checking out the show. I appreciate it. If you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRam with the hashtag Ask GSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. 
Drop a question in the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Uh, like I said earlier, check out the interviews from this week with Braun Strowman from Monday here on the channel and with NXT's Isaiah Swerve Scott from Tuesday right here on the channel as well. Uh, we have more in the days and weeks to come, so stay tuned for those. We got these Q&A videos every single Wednesday. We got network and chill videos breaking down Raw Talk, Talking Smack, Miz and Mrs., um, WWE 24, Broken Skull Sessions, Chronicle Untold, and everything else in between. So uh, check those out as well. Uh, the podcast excerpts, Wrestle Rant Radio every single Thursday. The excerpts usually go up every Thursday as well. The SmackDown audio reviews, because we don't talk about SmackDown on WrestleRant Radio, which we record on Thursday, so I do my own exclusive SmackDown audio review on Saturdays. Uh, we just put up a Star Wars holiday special review in light of May the 4th on Tuesday. We did a lot of uh, Falcon Winter Soldier reviews and WandaVision reviews, and we're going to do low-key reviews in a couple months, Mandalorian reviews. We, did, we reviewed the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe up to this point um, just recently. So there's a lot to look forward to. There's a lot to look forward to right now here on the channel. If you're not already subscribed, please do so. You are greatly missing out. I appreciate every single one of you's support for the channel. So thank you so much for that. Uh, but go enjoy Cinco de Mayo. Uh, maybe I'll have a quesadilla or something later. I'm not too extensive with my food choices, but I do love quesadillas and uh, stuff like that. So uh, uh, have a great day, guys. Enjoy blood and guts tonight. I'm definitely looking forward to it. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.